has happened so far to talk about just to make sure folks are aware of how the draft is being updated. Sorry, um, Daniel. I'm sorry to interrupt. I forgot to hit the record button until just now. <laughs> okay, so, great. I've just hit the record button, people. So if you have a problem with being recorded, that's you should have read the note well and uh, and not have a problem. But uh, I am recording now. Also, for people helping with minutes, um, that means we can go back to the recording if need be. So we are being recorded. Pardon me for the interruption. Um, thanks. And uh, there's no way to have like a sticky thing uh, in the chat that something that newcomers will see automatically. We can't, um, like in terms of the pad. I don't believe so. Not with this technology. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, all right. Well, maybe somebody else can paste, repaste the um, the Etherpad in the because um, I've heard a couple of doo doo sounds. So maybe someone can repaste the Etherpad regularly in the chat when that when that happens. That'd be great. Thank you. Um, so yeah, uh, uh, once we talked about how the draft has been developed, um, we will talk about what the next steps are for it. Um, and then finally, I want to just make sure folks are thinking about the. Uh, meeting at IETF 110, and uh, if possible, to try to think about when the next interim will be. We're not going to make any specific decisions here, um, but we want to try to get a sense of, of what, how people think about uh, where we're going. Stephen, you want to take the next slide? Um, okay, so uh, just a, a catch up for folks. Um, the, uh, the crypto refresh document um, is... Um, uh, was reset to RFC 4880. Um, that is, uh, we had this 4880 BIS, the working group got unchartered, like, um, and uh, it, it's been sort of running without a working group, um, but with an IETF name. So we reset <coughs> to RFC 4880, um, uh, and we're trying to import the changes from 4880 BIS-10, which was the last draft on that change. Uh, on that on that chain, um, so our goal here is to try to make to try to make sure that we import and review all of the pieces that differ from 4880. Um, so, <clears throat> draft 00 was 4880 with some minor formatting changes. Uh, draft 01 um, was fixing the open errata, uh, the ones that were confirmed. There are still a bunch of errata that are mentioned and sort of reserved for document update that people might want to take a look through, but we incorporated those, um, incorporated the Camellia ciphers um, and cleaned up a bit of the terminology. That technology cleanup um, included some changes to white space, which we have since reverted uh, because it was determined that uh, it didn't really cover exactly what we wanted it to cover. Um, uh, next slide. Sure. Uh, actually, uh, just to say thanks to Werner and Paul for being willing to be editors for these documents. It's, uh, it's not it's not the most uh, enjoyable part, but it's it's really worthwhile. Thanks. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, much much appreciated. Um, and also thanks to the other folks who volunteered uh, to step up as editor. Um, we're glad that we don't have to use everybody as editor, but we hope that everybody who is um, willing to consider it is also reviewing. Um, so O2 is the, the latest revision, uh, and that was posted uh, on Monday. Um, here we're starting to see a bunch of um, other changes incorporated that have some significant um, details. Um, so the, the top level changes that were made were that all the code points that had been in 4880 bis-10 um, have been reserved now, even though they're not being necessarily all specified. Uh, but that way we, they don't get clobbered in some future revision. Um, it's incorporated all of RFC 6637, or tried to, um, which covers the elliptic curve work, um, the, mainly the NIST curves. Uh, we've changed the specification, the, the registries. Nearly all of the registries went from uh, very strict uh, gatekeeping, like IETF consensus or IETF review, down to specification required. Uh, this means that should this draft progress to an ROC, um, it will be relatively easy for people to add new code points. Um, there are only two registries that are um, RFC required as opposed to specification required, meaning that something needs to get through the IETF standardization process. And those two are uh, packet version and, um, and I believe packet type itself. 
um, but all the rest required are just specification required, which means if you write a specification, you don't even have to necessarily publish it at the IETF. You just have to make sure it's in a stable spot, make sure there's some implementations and talk to IANA about it. Um, uh, you know, none of these changes will take full effect until the draft gets published as an RFC. Um, there's some deprecation of older cryptographic mechanisms that we know are broken. Um, there's the inclusion of SHA-3. Uh, and finally, there's the inclusion of Curve 255.19, which is, um, I guess people are calling them the, uh, the, the CFRG curves. Um, but specifically so far, it is only included and mentioned for elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman, that is the encryption variant, and it is not uh, currently in the draft for signing. Um, so we've had a bunch of folks do some review on the list. Uh, there's been some nitpicking and some specific non-nitpicky details, which uh, I'm grateful for. I know it hasn't been that long. It's only been a couple days, four days, I guess. Um, but I do hope that other folks would be willing to... Um, uh, we'll, we'll review this and look at the changes here. Um, if you are unclear about uh, where to find that stuff, um, next slide. Um, yeah, there we go. So the, the document is currently being worked on in Markdown. Um, if you are comfortable in Markdown with the text editor, you can get to the source of it. Um, we've already had a couple people post some diffs to the mailing list, which is great. Those are things that will make it easier to think about applying changes. Um, you can also use, if, if your changes are um, just minor nitpicks, you can also use the merge requests feature in GitLab uh, to request a change, but any change that has sort of substantive issues should um, uh, flow through the list as well, uh, just to make sure that, that we uh, everyone understands what's going on, what the discussion is. There is also an issue tracker at this GitLab instance um, and I've been using the issue tracker to sort of note things that have come up that maybe we can't deal with right away so that we don't lose track of them. Um, and I welcome folks to, uh, <clears throat> to, use the, um, to use the issue tracker for that purpose. And again, if you do that, please try to follow up on the list and make sure that the list knows that that's being done um, because the list is sort of the canonical place for this. The issue tracker is just, just gonna help us out. So if you look at this draft, um, if you look at this repo, you'll see in it three markdown files. Um, so there is rfc4880.md, which is an attempt to render RFC4880 itself, no changes, as markdown, from markdown with the toolchain that we have. There is also rfc4880bis.md, which is a markdown variant of the last version of draft IETF OpenPGP 4880bis-10. Um, the goal right now is that we're trying to bring the crypto refresh document up to parity with that. And so that's present in the repo uh, as a historical reminder and as something that we can compare against. And then finally, the document that we are working on is just named crypto-refresh.md in there. So when I've been looking at this and trying to propose what changes might come next, um, uh, I've been basically doing comparisons between RFC 4080bis.md and crypto refresh.md. So I welcome anyone else to take a look at those and try to look at what the remaining changes are. I um, uh, hope this makes sense. If anybody has any questions, again, I hope you feel free to shout them out. Um, you can also just put a plus Q in the chat. Yeah, this is probably um, check if people are clear on the, the process. It's, it is a little bit confusing. Yeah, so it is. Know. It's a historically clumsy thing. <laughs> um, but so right now, what we're trying to do is just import things and review things in the working group, establishing consensus on the sections of 4880bis um, that differ from 4880. Um, if we're going to get consensus on the document, the thought was it might be more straightforward to go piecemeal on this. Um, if anybody has any questions, uh, or if you try to use this and you have any problems with it, uh, I, you know, if you're trying it right now, you can raise the issues right now. If you try it later and you find yourself having issues, um, please post about them to the mailing list. We want to make sure that everybody, um, sees how this is being done and, and can make the changes, you know, can, can propose changes in ways that are easier to propose them. I figure most people are more comfortable with a text Git workflow than with the IETF draft process. 
So not seeing any other questions, I think we can go to the next slide where we maybe, talk about- maybe, maybe we're just checking if Paul or Werner have any anything to add at this point. Sure. Preferences for inputs or, or, or whatever, just, I mean, I guess the next upcoming point is about the, the content. I'm just wondering if Paul or Werner have anything that they want to talk about as to process. No, I don't um, have so, any concerns about the concepts. Yeah, me neither. Me neither. Um, I, I do have to go uh, make sure that from the notes on the mailing list that everything is uh, is tracked properly in the tracker, so that we can uh, we can either discuss this for consensus or merge them in. Yeah, but uh, yep. but so far it's looking good. I'm going to, um, in the latest round, I've been trying to do that. I have not done that yet for the responses on, on 02, but I will do my best to go through the current thread on 02 and make sure everything is represented in the issue tracker. Um, there are some things I think that will be relatively easy to just merge. Um, and there are other issues that I think are outstanding that we maybe don't have an answer for, but we can flag them. All right. So, um, so I was looking through the differences between 4080bis.md and uh, cryptorefresh.md and trying to identify topic level views of what, of, of what differences are. So this slide shows us a set of things. And this is a rough characterization. This is a characterization that I've done. Uh, it is not necessarily a guarantee. I, I may have missed something. I welcome ever, other people to do the same kind of view. Um, and uh, but this is an attempt to, to break down the things that are that were in 48bis-10 that are not yet in crypto refresh. Um, and I've categorized them here as things that seem to me to be within the chartered crypto refresh that we're doing, things that are crypto related, uh, but maybe aren't explicitly in the charter, but we might need them in order to achieve the charter. And there's several things that are not crypto related, not really in the charter, and um, uh, they're over in the right-hand column, despite some of those things being things that I care about. Um, I have to acknowledge that if our goal is completing the charter, we might want to focus on the columns further towards the left, and we can worry about the columns further on the right later. Um, note also that the registration, that the, the way that the specification, um, the registries have changed so that there's specification required. So if you care deeply about things that are just in the right-hand column, these are things you might be able to do um, to pick up later. Uh, I see Daniel in the queue. Daniel? Yes. Uh, the only thing I wanted to mention is that uh, the, in the, the intended recipient fingerprint could mm -hmm. be viewed, or I, I, I guess not that specific mechanism, but like um, some kind of mechanism to fix the um, surreptitious forwarding issue, right? Mm -hmm. Could be at least. Um, uh, viewed as a crypto re or at least, you know, security related feature. Yep. Um, that makes sense. These, these are not hard and fast, uh, categorizations here. This is my attempt to, to do that. And I, I can see your argument there. Um, mm -hmm. if you're concerned, you're, I think what you're saying is we, we see some known vulnerabilities in the current open PGP workflows, cryptographic mm -hmm. vulnerabilities that could be fixed by the intended recipients, uh, fingerprint sub packet, right? Right. Yeah. So we may want to we may want to try to promote that to the crypto related column. Uh, yeah, maybe. Um, I see a plus Q from from Werner. I, I don't know how to tell when people are out of the queue with this mechanism here. I, I um, can't. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, should we just use the raise hand thing? So ah, anyway. uh, So my comment is just about the brain pool thing that it's uh, here on the agenda. Um, the brain pool curves are actually uh, actually in 6637, and uh, I don't see that there's anything which uh, is relevant for uh, for crypto refresh, refresh because we already have implemented it years ago along with the list curves. And so that's just for a standard thing. Uh, thank you for the comment. Um... I actually don't see the brain pool mentioned in 6637. Um, but um, if you want to point that point out the specifics on the list, that would be um, that would be great. 
Uh, okay, so the thing is just that uh, the 6637 mentioned that you can use any OID for that. Uh, so uh, what we added is uh, the OID, uh, OIDs which are used for Brainpool, but the uh, uh, advantage of Brainpool is that there is only one OID for these curves. So there is no, not the problem we used to have with RSA things and so on, <laughs> many right. OIDs. Right, that makes sense. And it may be that, that you're just saying, here's how you could use Brainpool if you want to, is so straightforward that it's a small change and it's unobjectionable and we know people are using it we can just put it in yeah, um, yeah, but again exactly. we'd want to see we want to see that there are a couple of interoperable implementations right yeah it's it's actually on this curve uh, similar to this curve so we just uh, plug it, it it's just replace the parameters for the curves and that's it yep that makes sense um so I don't know that I want to do a full readout of the slide here just because it's a lot of text. Um, I'm hoping that everyone can see the slide. If you can't see the slides, please speak up. Um, but I appreciate the comments from Daniel and Werner about maybe uh, thinking about recategorizing a couple of the things that are placed on the slide. Um, does anybody else have thoughts about um, pieces here? Have I identified, have I missed something that was in 4080 bis that is not yet in crypto refresh um, topic wise? Um, uh, do folks have, uh, like, I, I want to make us make sure that we are in rough agreement on the pieces that are necessary to try to bring us towards our, towards parity. Um, and then, uh, I'd like to stay on this slide for a little bit if people don't have other issues with what's on here, um, and talk a little bit about how we think, um, what steps we think we should do, like in what order, um, to head towards something that we can get published. Uh, plus Q from Neil. Uh, I'd like to voice support for focusing just on the crypto refresh and then getting that out the door and afterwards immediately working on a, a new draft. So being super focused and not losing concentration on arguing about whether something could be crypto related or not. Uh, okay. I will point out that to do that work, we are going to need to recharter the working group. Um, and uh, I think we can. Um, I think we are actually, you know, the working group is functioning right now. We've got, you know, a, re, a, re, a new document posted roughly every couple of weeks. Um, there are comments coming in on the list from multiple implementers and consumers of these tools. Um, so I think that that uh, being able to do a, um, a recharter seems pretty plausible. I see plus Q from Andre. Um, yeah, I'm just... Uh saying that um, I would like to have all the issues here addressed in an update and not to go for another RFC. It's a huge pain in the ass, uh, honestly, to um, update um, certifications and so on for a new crypto standard. So um, any changes we are making now, they should be valid for the next 10 years or something like that and not require a new update immediately afterwards. So I'm basically just saying um, that I disagree with, with Neil's opinion. OK. Uh, I see a plus Q from Derek. Uh, so I'm going to agree with Andre and also disagree with Neil on that. There are some things that are on the not crypto list that I think should get done now. Um, there are certainly items on this list for example, some of the notation stuff that I, you know, personally I put in, um, but the other things on here as well that I think are fairly non-contentious and should be easily ad added in. We might find that there are some contentious issues here, uh, at which point then we might want to reconsider whether or not to what to do about those contentious issues. But for the non-contentious issues, I think we should include them, even if they're not necessarily directly crypto related. Thanks, Derek. Um, so I'm not seeing anybody else in the queue right now. Um, for what it's worth, I'd like to just jump in. I mean, I think this is something that we, we need to handle correctly um, because for two reasons. One is there's a working group charter, um, and we don't really want to go beyond that because that was scoped in a certain way. Uh, you know, if we succeed in that in meeting that charter, we can then go beyond it 
but um, and, and secondly, I think this working group this 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 is not the first time we've tried this, um, and one of the reasons I think that that it foundered last time was kind of trying to get too much done, um, and and kind of not focusing sufficiently on what needs to be done. So I I, I think the point about um, certifications and so on is is a valid one. Uh, you know, there, it, it's possible to to have a product certified according to more than one RFC. Though you don't necessarily need to have a single document first for a single certification. So there may be ways to handle it that, that way. Yeah, I think that the the point that Derek made might be um, a a pretty salient one for us, right? Which is the about the contentiousness of a feature. If something is uncontentious. Like there are no objections from people in the working group and it has multiple implementations and it doesn't seem to introduce new cryptographic uh, wrinkles that we haven't seen an evaluation for. Maybe that is something that we can just go ahead and include. Um, but again, if it's anything that causes contention or delay, I think that would be a real mistake. I think we want to make sure that we can get the thing out. Um, and you know, Andre, I I do I, I hear your concerns about um, certification against particular standards. Like that is that is a legit concern. Uh, at the same time, we if we don't have the standard at all, then there's nothing to to certify with. I see Ben in the queue. Yeah, this is Ben. I just wanted to jump in and note that in the ISG as a whole, we recently had a case or two where there was a document that came to us from a working group and it was sort of seen as exceeding the charter of the working group and that caused some problems. And so I think that the ISG as a whole might be particularly sensitive to staying within the charter uh, for the next you know, several months at least. So uh, we should be careful, but I do think that, you know, the current charter text does leave some room for you know, addressing issues that have been identified by the community and do not delay the enumerated items. So I, I think we have some flexibility here. Um, that was it. Paul was in the, is in the queue. Sorry, Paul, for not not seeing you this particular. No worry, it's not the best UI. Um, yeah, I just wanted to also clarify that um, as long as we're still in a draft, um, we can we can think we have consensus on all the previous versions that we've done. But then if someone joins and says, I actually disagree with that, like the consensus is only stuck forever once we publish the RFC. So um, I also would like to make sure that, you know, once we have like the largest chunk of crypto related things done, that we um, that we try to publish as an RFC and, and bring in all the other things um, also as quickly as possible, but in a separate document. Um, like if it's small things that fit in properly, uh, we can try and do it. But as soon as someone objects, I think we should um, uh, move it out again. And, and and I really don't want this draft to live forever. This draft has to go out quickly because otherwise we we repeat the previous cycle. Daniel, is plus one, sorry. Uh, yeah, so I think that's, I guess, that we, as chairs, then I guess we should take it uh, as a kind of an instruction from the working group then to keep an eye out for things that are becoming controversial and then ask if people want to keep including them or maybe put them off for later. And and if things are meet the requirements of being implemented and not controversial, then we shouldn't be getting in the way of that being included. Sounds good. Um, so uh, if folks have no other comments on this slide, I want to take uh, move on to the next one. Uh, can, can I just um, take a minute to check? I mean, do, you know, are, is there is there really nothing missing here? I mean, DKG is really good at this stuff, but is he that good? It, it may be difficult to, to verify it from like right now in real time, too. Um, I, I welcome anyone to go um, back to the repo and try look look at the diff between those between 
RFC 4080 bis.md and crypto refresh.md and see if there's any changes that are in there that are not identified here. Um, that's the technique I've been using anyway. If you have a different technique, that's also good. Well, yeah, so, so, I mean, yes, bringing stuff up on the list or in, in issues in the repo is all great. There's, again, I was just checking, there's nothing that somebody who's on the call here has in mind for, for, for one of these three columns that's, that's, not, that's missing. So I, I want to point out that, well, so this, this slide shows what we need to, what's in 480 bis, but not yet in crypto refresh, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the resultant document will be, will complete our charter. Um, uh, and the next slide actually has some discussions of potential additional things um, that we may decide are relevant in order to, to meet the charter responsibly. Um, and maybe we decide that they aren't, right? Uh, but but these are things that were not in 4080bis-10, um, but given that we're working on it now and not five years ago, um, those may be things that we think uh, need to be included at this point. Um, so I, I only found two when I was doing my own review. This is a harder review to do because you're not just looking at a diff and identifying things. Um, but those are the two, the idea of including curve 48, um, which is you know another modern curve, um, which is stronger than curve 255.19 um, and Argon 2 as a, as a, you know, the, the winner of the password hash competition, um, figuring out how to do those things in the context of OpenPGP seem to me like those are things that would be relevant for bringing OpenPGP's cryptography into the modern world. Um, and those were not those were not possible when we tried this last time because they didn't you know they, they hadn't they either hadn't won the password hash competition in the case of Argon two or curve four forty eight hadn't really been settled on as the as the plus extra curve. Um, there may be other things that um, people who understand the crypto and the risks um, will think are necessary beyond um, beyond parity with bis dash ten. Anyone have thoughts about these or thoughts about what's missing from this list? I guess a quiet queue is a good queue. Yeah, so so I was I was having a look over the zero two documents, the crypto refresh zero two, and the argon two one occurred to me as well. I I don't know. Have people already implemented something there, or is it uh, is would that be new? And Werner is in the mic line. Okay, um, our argon two. I don't think it makes much sense for OPGP to uh, extend the symmetric encryption uh, stuff here, in particular for uh, using passphrases or manual type passphrases and that's using icon two. The problem I see with this is that uh, all implementations, uh, it only makes sense if it would be mandatory to implement and uh, for interoperability reasons. And I doubt that we can do and will do this because of uh, sub props of icon two in uh, unintended usage. Um, so reserving a code point would be, be okay for me, but uh, making it mandatory to implement or even to, uh, should are uh, something I don't don't see for OpenPGP because OpenPGP is in the first place in the public key uh, public key uh, protocol. Um, so, sorry, can you? I didn't. I just didn't catch what you said. The reason why you wouldn't implement. Um, could could you re just restate, restate that? I just didn't catch the words. Uh, okay, uh, uh, for interoperability re reasons, uh, because we all need to implement that, all implementations need to have that, uh, because S2K and new uh, S2K um, <clears throat> system makes only sense if, if they're all if all implementations got this, and so we are b breaking a lot of a lot of stuff with that. And on the other hand, uh, I don't see that uh, symmetric encryption is something which uh, should be primary. Uh, goal of OpenPGP because OpenPGP is public key protocol. Okay, so I think it was worth unpacking the argument for why this needs to be mandatory to implement because I'm not yeah. sure that I understand it and there are probably other folks that are on the call that don't fully understand it. Can you explain why you think it would need to be mandatory to implement? 
yeah. Uh, <coughs> so for what do you need S2K? So one thing is uh, protect your um, uh, protect your uh, private key for that. Okay, that's not that's not a problem because it's a local a local thing. Uh, yeah. Right. But there's the no interoperability is, issue there. Yeah, less than. But the other thing is uh, symmetric encryption. And if you start to use uh, symmetric encryption on a wide scale, uh, you need to have uh, some way to manage symmetric keys, and you are surely not using a KDF function to uh, improve the passphrases, but you use full NTP passphrases for this. And so this does not make sense to make it stronger. But I, I think that is something we can't discuss here right now. With, um, goes too much into the details. Uh, so we have Daniel and then Andre in the queue. So Daniel? Yes, uh, I mean, I guess I'm not sure how much you want to go into the details you need, but I personally think that um, uh, an S2K update is very important. Uh, I think both, both for, uh, as Werner said, protecting private keys, which for example, uh, m multiple applications, you know, we have to for, uh, private keys encrypted with S2K on the server. Uh, Flowcrypt also backs up private keys encrypted with a password. Um, in, in Gmail accounts, which is like, um, you know, an untrusted environment, right? And also for symmetric encryption, I think it is quite important uh, as, as um, let's say, with uh, OpenPGP.js maintainer hat on, uh, I see quite a lot of people using that. It's like an easy way to, uh, you know, implement <laughs> symmetric encryption when, when that's what you need, right? And I would like, you know, OpenPGP.js symmetric encryption to be secure by default and OpenPGP symmetric encryption in general, right? And I think without uh, an S2K update, I think an S2K update is really needed to uh, make sure that it's secure and you know that all the all the mechanisms that the specification provides uh, are secure, basically. Okay. Um, then So I think we had Andre in the queue. Oh, sorry. Um, 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 Daniel, um, I have to go to the complete opposite standpoint of your opinion. Um, for me, um, people are encrypting symmetrically files that are maybe 10 years old, 20 years old, and they want to decrypt them. And any change there, is an API break basically, um, which is huge. So if we don't have a real huge security issue that our current S2K algorithm doesn't cover to switch to something else that people with PGP 2.6 released in the 2006 years, can't decrypt anymore. Um, that's a really big issue. It's well, an API break in our standard for something where, okay, it's slightly more secure, but the operational security of handling your passphrase, of handling your security things, this is way more important than the algorithms. It, it um, doesn't necessarily have to be an API break. We can introduce a new algorithm uh, for, you know, new encryptions without necessarily breaking old decryptions. Yeah, not really. Uh, because I have customers that really have the state that they're using the latest and greatest GNU-PG and they are communicating with people that are using PGP 2.6, uh, which was released 2006. Um, and 
they want to be interoperable and any change we do to our crypto standards um it has to be really sought sought out and really necessary and not just um because we think it's more elegant or we think it's it's better okay so i think so i think fairly clearly we probably want to record this as an issue to be to, to come back to at least but uh, i think i have derek and then dkg in the queue so derek thanks uh, i was going to point out that there we already have compatibility issues with 2.6 if nothing else there's idea um i've got decades worth of encrypted emails sitting in my you know, mail folders that I can't encrypt or can't decrypt and read today uh, because they're encrypted with idea. And yeah, yes, I know I can use GPG-1. I know that I can use, uh, uh, I, I, the way I've been doing it is by adding in the idea.so uh, into the, the, the code. But the point being that I can't use latest and greatest to be able to read this stuff. So at some point, either I need to re-encrypt it or you know the the applications need to have some way to uh, to add you know these old methods back in, or you know you, you or you just have this cutoff where you just can't read old stuff anymore. So there, there there's multiple ways you can do it, um, and there's multiple answers. Um, I don't have the right one. I don't have a suggestion for the right one. But I was pointing out that we've already crossed that bridge overall. So so bringing it up again is just a, a kind of a non-starter. So I, I mean, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's only, and it's only becomes an issue if you actually get rid of the old stuff, adding a new one doesn't necessarily add an incompatibility. Uh, so I have in the queue DKG and then Andre, and then on oh, Derek is out, so DKG. We're not hearing you, Daniel. All right, I'm here. Can you hear me now? Yes. Um, so I agree with Derek that adding a new S2K mechanism does not need to break interoperability with the old stuff that was on disk. Um, it would use a different S2K uh, identifier, I'm assuming. Um, again, this is a situation where actually having text to consider would make it useful. We could say we could determine whether that happens. Um, Secondly, I feel like the argument that I'm hearing that says we can't introduce a new um, S2K mechanism because it makes it difficult to know when you're allowed to use it or not. I think that's I think there's some truth to that, right? Um, we can introduce new uh, public key algorithms and we can tell or, or symmetric ciphers and we can tell whether they're usable because we can see people's um, certificates when you're encrypting to them. You can look at those and say, does this person indicate a preference? But if you're doing symmetric crypto, you don't actually have any indication about the, what the recipient's capabilities are. So there's a concern there that that if you do symmetric crypto and you are using something that the recipient can't can't handle, that you give them an undecryptable message. So I hear that. At the same time, I think what that argument is saying, if I follow it to its logical conclusion, is we can never change the S2K algorithms. And even if we decide that PBKDF2 uh, is seriously problematic for some cryptographic, you know, some crypto analytic reason, it doesn't matter. There is no way for us to ever add any new um, S2K mechanisms in the spec. And that seems odd to me. Like, I don't think that's a great outcome. It's not a great place for us to be. It seems to suggest that open PGP uh, password based crypto is stuck using PBKDF2. And if there's any problems in that, open PGP is just dead for, for password based crypto. That seems problematic to me. Um, and so if we're going to say that's not the case, then we, then I think we have a responsibility since we're trying to do a crypto refresh to say, what is the current best state for doing this? And then to think about what the deployability concerns are. Uh, so I think we have Andre next in the queue. Yeah. Um, thank you, Daniel. Um, you basically made my point. Um, I'm totally in agreement that we don't want to have PKDF um, forced forever. We have this flexibility and we surely want to have our standards that they are flexible to switch this, these standards. 
So, when a vulnerable, vulnerability occurs, then we can switch. But currently, um, it's something like a switch in, in, in the SQK algorithm. It's painful for our users. So, we have to think about it when we want to enforce it. And when it's cryptographically necessary, we should be prepared to do this. And to have the option to flexibility uh, or flexible change this, these algorithms, that's great. That's totally my opinion. And to have Argon2 uh, in this, it's great. I have no objections to this, but I just don't want to have a default switch that's not related to current attacks. So, yeah, I, I think we are basically on the same line here. Um, yeah, so that's it for me. Okay, Daniel, you're back in the queue. Thanks. So, um, what I'm hearing is that um, we want to be able to switch to new uh, S2K mechanisms at some point in the future, but we don't want to automatically start deploying and sending messages that are encrypted with those mechanisms in the future. So that sounds to me like what we need is we need a, a specification yesterday that says, here's what you should do, how to interpret things like this, um, and you should not generate them. If you do generate them, you may risk interoperability problems, right? But we need a specification having landed so that everyone knows how to at least interpret the stuff if we ever want people to be able to generate them. So it sounds to me like this is something that we actually do need to do in this particular draft, as contentious as it may be. Okay, so this uh, just we have runner in queue. We're coming up to ten minutes to the hour. We kind of promised to to be about an hour. So I don't know how many people can. If, if somebody has a real problem with running a few minutes over, then please let us know in the chat. Uh, and and just before Werner goes, I, I say I guess what at the at the least what we should do is create an issue to to track that. There's there are there are things to talk about. There are many good points for or against inclusion of Argon too. Um, that we definitely need to track and come back to. So we should create an issue for that. And uh, Werner? Yeah, okay. Uh, the Yaga 2 thing has been discussed on the mailing, on the mailing list uh, a, a lot. And uh, I, I don't think it makes sense to start with this actually uh, tiny uh, tiny item again here in the, in the, in the conference. Uh, either we can include it or when we will have a specification to let, uh, later add that if, that, if we it seems to be pretty clear that we can't uh, come to an agreement on, on this. So let's better stop with that here on this argument. Yeah, well, I'd be more hopeful that we can come to an agreement, but, but we don't need to do it right now today. Uh, did, did people have thoughts on Curve 448? Um, is that you know, not really needed because it's just coming up to a wrong, it's a fashion statement, or it's something that really is needed, or it's something that lots of people have already done? I don't know the answer to any of those. Fair again, thanks. Yeah, okay. So so in UPG, we, we implemented uh, 448, 448 um, but we also realized that um, to do this properly in the specification, we would need to have a new data type for this, actually for, for everything. So, uh, that could delay us even more. So uh, if we could add 448 um, with not a really rock solid specification, that's that that's okay to, to me, but uh, we can also leave it leave it out. Um, that's my thing. So just to just to be sure I understood that very you're suggesting that it might be reasonable to allocate a code point but leave the spec leave the detailed specification for later. Was that what you said? Yeah, more or less yeah, that, yes. Okay, great, thanks. Other thoughts on the point? Mm 
Okay, good. We're not seeing as anything as controversial there. That's good. Um, the what about the dot 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 part of DKG slides? Um, is there anything that we think is important enough and uncontroversial enough that we should consider? And silence is, is fine here. Uh, Angel? And then Andre. Angel. Hello. Well, Maybe may not so uncontroversial, but on the line of the before point about uh, symmetric algorithms, uh, we have the same problem on uh, public A ones, because if tomorrow there is a, we need to change to cure for for rate, uh, that's a breaking change for people wanting to communicate with that. So perhaps uh, there should be a way to use uh, new new algorithms while keep being compatible with all ones. But that would be a, well, a big change. Okay, uh, Andre? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not relating to Angel's point. So um, do you want to discuss Angel's point? Uh, uh, anyhow, so my, po my, my point is um, regarding the old um, traveling thing of open PGP keys without user IDs. Um, we haven't discussed this in this meeting yet. And I think there's a huge split in our community regarding this issue. Um, and maybe we should discuss it. I mean, we have six minutes, uh, basically, uh, on our agenda. So, um, that's not really the time we should take for this. Um, but yeah, I mean, um, just to give you my viewpoint and then I will be quiet. It's, um, uh, as an implementer of a mail client and um, and a file encryption client with Cleopatron and GPUL, um, I have no idea what I should do with PGP keys without user IDs. They are basically data crap. And that some people in this team here um, are proposing that these keys are supposed to be pushed and provided and default in Debian. That's a huge issue for me because it breaks all my software. And for the new PGP standard, I know there were discussions that um, keys without user IDs should be allowed. And I'm very much against it. And maybe we should discuss this issue. Uh, I think the uh, typing was not muted. But, uh, nice to hear, but uh, probably better not to hear. Uh, so I, I guess what I heard Jim saying basically is that we should create an issue for dealing with keys without user IDs. Um, so somebody should create an issue in the in the tracker for that. I, I, I'm hoping DKG will. And then in the queue, I guess people do want to discuss this. I see Vincent. Um, yeah. So, so uh, I feel like this addresses me. Um, the, uh, there seems to be a misunderstanding of what the point of open PGP keys without user IDs is. Uh, so at least what you describe as that those should be pushed to uh, to key servers and uh, can be downloaded from there. The point of those keys is not to to use them as such, but only exclusively to uh, gain updates from them. 
because you can still merge the keys that you retrieve, even without user IDs, you can still merge in revocation certificates and subkey updates. Well, but yes, I agree. You can't actually uh, use them as they are for the purposes that you would uh, use a key for that has a user ID. That is, uh, those are just different use cases that you can provide uh, keys for. No, what I would like to clarify is in RFC 4880BIS, if it is legal, legal RFC meaning, um, to provide such keys. Because in our account RFC, it's kind of a gray area. I think it's disallowed. Um, and you're doing it anyway. And yes for for an update of our rfc we should maybe consider if we should could clarify this i agree i would like to see that there are there are multiple things that people transmit that are open pgp related that are not specified in the draft i don't know that we can um fully outline all of them you know, one common example that I've seen is that people transmit a free floating revocation signature um, and expect people to incorporate that into their key stores. Um, uh, that goes under the term revocation certificate, I hear people call it. Um, it, it is not in the draft. Uh, it's commonly widely done, it's accepted, and it appears to be super useful. So maybe what we want is we want a section that describes common formats of things that people uh, transmit. And that could include both um, certificates with user ID stripped and revocation certificates. I could look at that. Uh, Neil? So if my reading of 4880 is correct, then currently, you can provide a TPK that has a user ID, but no signature. Um, so Hagrid, the keys.openphp.org uh, software could come into compliance by simply providing a null user ID. So it seems like 4880 already talks about this issue. Okay, so can we take the next slide? Um, <laughs> thank you, Stephen, for the prompt. Uh, I want to remind everyone here we're about at time here. I don't want to run us over too long. I want to remind people we have another meeting coming up. Uh, it will also be about an hour. Uh, it is in almost exactly uh, two weeks. Um, if you have not yet registered for the IETF, you should register to do that. Uh, there is a registration fee. Uh, you can do a one day registration fee if you want a smaller fee, or there is a registration fee waiver, which can be done on a sort of no questions asked basis. Um, I appreciate the discussion that we've had here today. Uh, and I think we're making good progress towards identifying what needs to be done. Um, and hopefully we can keep that momentum up. Um, so I hope that the folks who are here will also come to IETF 110. If you have a specific issue that you think should be on the 110 agenda and you want to present it, um, or you want someone else to present it, please mail either the list or the chairs. Um, and we can uh, try to make sure that that happens. We already have a couple of folks who are lined up to try to, to give some presentations there, uh, but we welcome other suggestions. So just one note on the red, or two notes on that. One is on the registration fee waiver. The intent of that is to allow people to participate for whom paying would be difficult. Uh, it's an honor-based system. So, uh, you know, it's, if, if it turns, there, there's no tracking of that being done essentially other than the number of people taking advantage of a waiver. If the number of people taking advantage of waivers gets to the point where it impacts on the costs of meeting, of holding meetings, then the waiver thing might disappear. So I, I would encourage people who need to use it to, to please do take advantage of it. Uh, but people who don't need to use it to, to you know, maybe do the pay, pay for the, the day or the week as need be. Uh, and then the other point to note, I think, is that the 
the session at ITF 110 is likely to have kind of a bigger group um, of, you know, not in, including people who are not active participants. Um, so it might, it, issues that are more suited for that are ones where we would like other people to know about the work going on in the working group. And if there are, if there are issues that could wait until May or sometime that are more detailed for mostly only of concern to, to more active participants, they might be better left to the interim after which I guess leads me to prompt DKG to say next slide again. Next slide again. Um, so I think it would be good for us to schedule another interim meeting uh, before the uh, between the two IETFs. Um, if we want to land directly between the two IETFs, that would be early May. Um, if we think that meetings like this are useful, uh, I'd like to hear from folks on the list how they feel about that. But if, if folks feel like meeting like this is useful, we could also do multiple interims between IETFs. Um, so that could we could put something, um, for example, in early April, if we want to try it, we could even do like a monthly interim meeting if we think that this kind of discussion is fruitful. Um, if we're going to do interim meetings with more frequency, uh, I would actually request that people identify specific topics that they want to cover. We can queue them up. Um, some of them will have been queued already by the revisions of Crypto Refresh. Um, but I'd like to hear from folks on the list about when they think the next interim would uh, should be. You can also oh mention it now. Uh, so yeah, given we're at time, I, I, let's assume that the suggestion of early May is reasonable. Um, if people would like to speak to some other alternative, either doing it earlier or later, or at some other cadence, that would be good to hear. Again, now we're on the list. So now is your chance to, if you want to bring it up now. Okay, we'll take it to the list in the minutes and so on, but with the, the suggestion will be early May, um, Daniel suggests semi regularly. So, I mean, I guess we don't. We also don't want to put too much pressure on the, on the editors because kind of each of these will cause work for them as well. So, you know, monthly might be too soon uh, or too regular. Sorry. Um, so let's assume early May. We'll organize that, and if confirmed, the list. I mean, is every four to six weeks reasonable? I mean, I I think four to six weeks is reasonable. Yeah, I guess you know, as it as it fits nicely between ITF meetings um, and so on. So, okay, so that's. I think that brings us to the end of our planned agenda. Um, so there's there's probably an any other business kind of call here. Is there anybody have any other business? Not hearing any. Thanks uh, again for, for note taking. Um, I guess, KG, do you want to declare the meeting closed unless you have something else to say? Yeah, I think we can declare it closed. I saw a little hand wave from Werner. I don't know what that actually means. Um, <laughs> I, I couldn't have thought that was a goodbye or a, I want to speak or, or what. Um, I failed to do uh, video to get any video working uh, on this session. I just saw the slides. Um, uh, um, so I sort of second Eustace's preference for a different video conferencing solution, um, but, uh, we can figure that out on the list too. Um, but yeah, it, barring any other business, I think we should, we should close it. I, I'm really actually heartened to see the discussion that's happening here. Uh, um, and I hope that folks will continue in that vein. Um, uh, continue it on the mailing list if you can. Um, the IETF Jabber Room. Stephen, do you know if that Jabber Room will be open if people want to join and have a discussion there? The IETF or... Jabber Room is always open. Uh, so you can join that anytime. And there is a option now. They're running some experiments that if you have a matrix.org client, there's a way to get into it, uh, which I tested earlier and it didn't quite work, but more or less kind of worked. And there's some other... Uh, Zulip or something is the name of another messaging solution that can also interoperate with those rooms. Great. 
Okay, well, I don't want to uh, keep folks for longer. I read, people are probably busy, um, but I thank you all for a productive discussion and I uh, look forward to seeing more comments on the list. Thanks, okay. everybody. Have a good weekend. So many bee boobs. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just grabbing a copy of the notes. Uh, uh, yeah, I will grab a copy um, of the note of the Etherpad. Do we okay. have? Does our recording include the chat? Because there was a bunch of interesting discussion in the chat as well. I copied some of the relevant chat comments, uh, mostly about agreeing and disagreeing with speakers, into the uh, notes as well. That's great. Thank the you. recording, I believe, does not cover the chat, if I recall correctly. <laughs> uh, but I've also just cut <laughs> I just hope we've done some more side talking. Wow. Um, Vincent, by the way, when I have you here, um, I would be interested to have a talk with you. I mean, we would have met in FOSDEM, but this didn't happen this week. Yeah, yeah, that's right, year. unfortunately. Um, so maybe we can just ch schedule a talk uh, maybe sometime. Um, sure. Yeah. Did you want to talk about the uh, the user IDs issue or did you have something else? Uh, just generally. Just I mean, generally. Um, it, sorry to interrupt. This is probably I know you for... <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, sorry, we're hijacking the session. It's also yeah. being recorded, though, you guys, just so you know. Oh, oh okay, but, but the session was done.